I did want to thank Aisha for the introduction and for looking after me, and to Richard and all the team, the Durham team at Radford. So thank you for making it all happen. Uh, I feel quite humbled to be uh, included in such a lineup of amazing speakers and um, uh, with sto so many stories to tell, and I want to acknowledge them too. And what I would give to be described as an adventurer like Jessica is. Anyway, I get the title of commissioner. <laughs> Sounds really boring. Um, um, she, she, Shay? Shay thinks he's got the best job in the world, but I reckon I have a great job. As National Children's Commissioner, my role is to promote the rights and interests of all children and young people across Australia. That means for those of you who are young in the audience, I work for you all. There's 5.2 million of you, and you are the boss of me. So if you want to just get me aside and tell me what I should be doing, I'm great, I, I, I'll do it. Um, the thing that guides me in my work is the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. It sets out a, right, uh, um, a range of things called, in articles, called rights. Like the right to be safe, the right to be respected and treated fairly, the right to have fun, the right to education, the right to culture and good health. And it also says that children and young people have a right to get information, to have a say, and to have their views taken seriously. When children and young people know about the convention and their human rights, it makes them stronger. I'd like you to think about the articles of the convention, the rights Australia has promised to you all as like pieces of armour you can put on to protect yourself when you need it. The idea of human rights is not new and probably goes back thousands of years, hundreds of, or thousands of years. But ideas about children's rights are much, much newer. For a long time, in fact, children really didn't have rights. They were seen as the property of their parents. And this meant that when your great great when your great-grandparents were growing up last century, their parents had almost total control over them. And it was, it was actually the impact of the two world wars that made people think more about human rights and how these could be extended to everyone in the world and to help make the world a more peaceful place. And that was why the United Nations, or the UN as it's sometimes called, was formed and one of the first things it did was create the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And this articulated a set of fundamental rights across civil, political, legal, social, economic and cultural aspects of the life, of life that simply exist and exist simply by the fact of being human. These are the rights we all have in common, rights we all need to be okay and to go well in life. But it was not till 1990 that the Convention of the Rights of the Child came into force. This convention is a treaty with the status of international law which obliges each of the parties to it, including Australia, to deliver against it and to regularly report on performance. It has 54 articles operating under four guiding principles. These principles are non-discrimination, and we've heard a little bit about that today. Best interests of the child. This means that our laws and policies need to act, put the best interests of the child first, and that we're making decisions, adults should consider how this will affect children. The right to life, survival and development, and respect for the views of the child. Children have a right to be involved in decisions that affect them and have their opinions taken into account. But what about the rights of parents? The United States is the only country that has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The Convention has more signatories, actually, than any other international treaty. I think that says something powerful about how much the world values its children and young people. But in America, there is a strong concern among some groups that ratifying the convention would give children more rights than their parents and would interfere in parents' ability to raise and discipline their children. 
but this fundamentally misunderstands the Convention and its aims. Children and parents' rights are not in competition. They coexist and complement each other. The rights in the Convention are designed to balance the need to protect children because of their vulnerability against recognition that they are developing human beings who are entitled to have their voices heard. And in fact, under Article 5 of the Convention, there is a specific recognition of, of parents' role in protecting and guiding children. And it also says that governments must support uh, families and parents in this role. But at the same time, children have the right to be visible and to be heard under Article 12 uh, of the Convention. It's probably my favourite article. Mm. And as I often say to kids, being heard and having a say doesn't mean you get what you want. It's just about being in the conversations you need to be involved in. And the balance uh, has shifted over the years and evolved as the world's evolved. Children and young people have evolved. We've all evolved. In modern law, there's a famous case that talks about children's rights to decide things for themselves. In 1982, in England, a person called Mrs Gillick took her local health services to court to stop doctors from giving contraceptive advice or treatment to under 16 year olds without their parents' consent. The judge, in the end, didn't agree with Mrs Gillick and said that if a child can show that they understand what's going on and have enough information and maturity, they should be able to make decisions about contraception, about contraception without consent from their parents. This principle became known as the Gillick Principle and is now a across many areas of law and decision making concerning young people. It recognises that while parental consent is mostly necessary for younger children, um, as children develop, begin to have their own lives and understand more complex construct and ideas, they should enjoy a degree of, a degree of control over their lives as independent rights holders. After all, for, you, for the young people in the audience, you are the expert in your own lives. Too often, adults make decisions about children and young people without including them. And by doing that, we disempower and disrespect young people and we often get the decision wrong. By involving young people in decision making and in civic life generally, we respect their human rights, help them grow their confidence, and tap into their brilliant ideas, like the kind of ideas we're seeing here, ideas that speak to the now and speak to the future. That's why hearing your voices is so important. Meaningful participation in your own lives, in your communities and schools, is vital to ensuring we understand who you are, what's important to you, and what will work for you, and that adults like me act in your best, best interest, um, as you define it rather than how I or other adults might define it. As young leaders, some of you will be out, out in front and in the limelight. Others will be working away behind the scenes. It doesn't matter which of these paths you take. What matters is what and how you lead and what, who and how you follow. What you choose to see, who you listen to, what opportunities you grasp and what you choose to act on. As young leaders, what matters most is what is in your heart. The idea of Durham Durham, the meaning of Durham Durham, is all about human rights. It's about our shared humanity, the things we have in common, the energy we generate by acknowledging and inspiring each other. And it's about rising up together as individuals to be the best and to do the best you can. And it's about seeing what happened to those boys up in Darwin and saying that just isn't right. It's about how we can use our mutual connectedness to work together to build a better world for every child and young person. Whether they're, there, whether they're locked up in a hot jail in the Northern Territory, whether they're stuck on Nauru waiting for their claims for asylum to be processed, whether they are homeless on the streets of my hometown in Sydney, or whether they are coming together for a winter festival in Chile, Canberra. Like we say at the Human Rights Commission, where I work, human rights are for everyone, everywhere, every day. So to finish up, you'll be pleased to know, Richard, 
Um, I'd like you to all do something for me. I'd like you to all stand up. Um, now, I want you to raise your right hand in front of you. Now, bring it down with the palm facing up. Right, I have to keep it. Now, put your left arm up and point, point a finger in the sky. Yeah. And now, bring your finger down and place it in the palm of the person on your left. <laughs> right. Now, when I say the word dirham dirham, I want you to simultaneously try and catch the finger in your right palm and lift up your finger in the other, on the other arm <laughs> to avoid being caught by the hand of the person on your left. Got it? <laughs> Ready? Now, keep your fat palms flat, don't cheat. Is on the dirt or the dirt and dirt? Where would you go? Ready, set. Dirt and dirt. Festivities here today. I very much look forward to meeting you and learning about you and your ideas and hopes and dreams because you all have them. And I hope you'll be challenged and energised and that you find ways to let your light shine. But most of all, have fun. Thank you.